Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Frederick Bushman. He goes by Rick. Uh, he's the William Maul Measley Professor in microbiology. We're going to talk about uh, a couple of topics surrounding uh, HIV and um, you know some of the pathologies there and gene therapy and things like that. So, Rick, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, if you would, in your, uh, in your own words, tell me about your research and your interests. Well, I've been studying microbes since the early 80s. I've... Um, when I was in college, it was just becoming possible to make things out of DNA, to manipulate DNA and um, see what happened as a result. It was just really, really cool to have this new technology coming on. And so that led me into the field of studying microbes. I worked initially on not on microbes, but on sea urchins and uh, sea urchin development, and they were cool. You can the virtue there is you can get a tube full of sea urchin embryos, and if you're interested in em embryology, you can study a lot of staged embryos. But it was a pretty limited system beyond that. And so, when I got into graduate school, I, I studied urchins as a technician. Then I went to graduate school, and I wanted things that proceeded faster. I was just really impatient, and uh, so I studied fruit flies, and you could do a lot more faster there. And then bacteria, you could really do experiments quickly. And then I pretty much hit bottom with bacterial viruses, which were they, the growth cycle is something like 20 minutes. And you could really do a lot of experiments really fast and make things, figure things out. It was just totally great. And so I've been studying viruses and bacteria and microbes experimentally ever since, and very happy to do so. Oh, so you've been studying, well, some people call them like phages or bacteriophages, yeah, right? That's right. Bacteriophages. Um, studied many kinds of viruses. This is um, following my graduate research. We studied phages and DNA binding proteins, how uh, proteins that stick on DNA dictate its activity. And I wanted to study proteins that bind DNA and change it afterwards. And a very important system at the time was HIV, of course, and HIV integration. As you probably know, retroviruses grow by having a their genetic material is a polymer called RNA, and then that's copied after they enter a cell into another polymer, DNA, and that's integrated into host cell chromosomes. And um, that system didn't work in vitro. Uh, you couldn't take purified components and reconstruct that reaction. So my, my postdoc uh, research turned on establishing HIV integration in vitro. And we got it going. And the pharmaceutical industry picked up those assays. And after an ocean of work on their side in 2007, integrase inhibitors came to be used in patients. And they're one of the most important inhibitor classes for patients today. So well, let me ask you about that briefly. Um, from my knowledge over, over millions of years, certain viruses, and I guess they would be retroviruses, actually become part of their host DNA permanently? Is that what uh, HIV does or in people, does it endogenize into their DNA? Well, HIV will integrate into cells in your immune system. Once you're infected, it'll they'll infect your immune systems. That's part of the reason it's so hard to get rid of is the virus is growing on and killing cells that would normally be involved in getting rid of it. So HIV will cause an infection. Now, there's another kind of retroviruses called endogenous retroviruses, which infect germ cells. And so um, will the eggs or sperm. And so will expand to every cell in your body and uh, as you grow and be heritable. And it turns out the human genome is some 8% recognizable remnants of retroviruses that infected the germline, eggs and sperm cells in the primate lineage leading to humans. So to a very considerable degree, we are made out of retroviruses. 
these sequences. Some of them are, are just benign passengers, don't do anything. Some of them contribute start and stop signals to uh, host cell genes. And once in a while, the retroviral proteins have been um, adopted by the host cell to make new human proteins. Absolutely fascinating area. Um, one aspect yes, uh, of the human virome then is the all these endogenous retroviruses. Though it's worth adding that in humans, these viruses are all mutated to death. They're recognizable in sequence information, but they don't work anymore. In some other organisms, there are active endogenous retroviruses, like in many mouse strains, and that can have a big effect on their biology. That's what I was going to ask you. Um, are there any endogenized vir- retroviruses in people that under the right conditions could form virions again that would you know, leave the cells and you know, take off on their own? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. So far, the data seems to say no, that there are, these sequences are recognizable, but no longer work as viruses. However, they can still do stuff. They might provoke immune responses. Um, some of the viral proteins are important in human development, actually. The uh, evolution has co-opted some of these functions to do stuff uh, that's important in human biology. So one of the many reasons for thinking the human virum, which is one of our main topics of research today, is so totally cool, is this uh, component of endogenous retroviruses, the degree to which we're largely made out of viral sequences ourselves. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about our virum. So I I guess it would be composed at least of two pieces, um, viruses that would infect our cells or live commensally with them, and then bacteriophages that infect the bacteria and maybe mycophages and, you know, yeast phages, things like that. What what percentage of our virome are our bacteriophages versus viruses, let's say, that would affect us? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question and one that we've put studied a lot, put a lot of effort into studying in recent years. And it's a hard problem. So um, in order to tell you why it's a hard problem, let's l- let me just fill in some background for you. So there are incredible numbers of viruses in the world. In rich seawater, there's something like 10 to the seventh virus-like particles per mill of seawater, 10 million virus-like particles per mill of seawater, just incredible amounts. Somebody did the calculation that if you put all these viruses end to end, they would stretch for many light years away from Earth, just incredible numbers. So one consequence is that if you take a sample of, da- of viruses from the world and analyze it and sequence it, and then ask what, does, what se- do these sequences look like compared to other things other people have studied, compared to what's in the database, you usually find there's very little matching. And that's just, be, I think, because the pool size is so large of all the, san- all the types of viruses in the world and the numbers that people have studied previously are comparatively quite small. So there's this issue of the dark matter, this uh, genetic dark matter comprised of of largely of, of viruses. And so that complicates trying to understand what's going on inside humans, because we can't necessarily easily recognize everything that's there. So the human, but nevertheless, we can say a lot about the human virome. So there are, as people, as you will well know, as most listeners will well know, there's um, viruses that infect you and stay with you, like herpes viruses, HIV, unfortunately, and some other uh, chronic viruses. There are viruses that affect you acutely and then go away. Uh, Happily, SARS-CoV-2 is usually cleared and goes away. Um, Cold virus. um, Sometimes we deliberately infect ourselves with viruses, like the vaccinia virus, which is the vaccine strain that prevents smallpox. However, that's just the tip of the iceberg, kind of as you were saying. There are huge numbers of viruses elsewhere. There are all the endogenous retroviruses, 8% of the genetic material in every cell looks like it's derived from a virus. And then in the human microbiome, uh, as many listeners will know, there are many, many cells, at least as many as there are human cells in your body. And many of those cells will have viruses that infect them. And so you can take, for example, a a sample from gut and purify virus-like particles by physical uh, separation methods, and then look under a microscope. And you can see something like 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th virus-like particles per gram of intestinal contents, just very large amounts of virus, huge numbers. So if you looked at our our stool, for instance, you would find, what, perhaps 10 to the 8th viruses in it per gram? 
10 to the ninth per gram, just huge amounts. So, I mean, what's going on with all these guys? What's the deal? I mean, there's so many questions you want to ask. But then if you take these samples and break open the particles and sequence the genetic material, usually they don't look like stuff you've ever seen before. You have to try pretty hard to be able to recognize, you know, distant relatives of the different genes, the different components of the encoded by these genomes. And with enough effort, you can start to start to see patterns, start to see, you know, what probably are proteins you've seen before in other viruses at least once in a while and start to do some annotation. Now, that's the, the this vast population of phage. Most of what's there is phage and hard to recognize. Once in a while, you see a virus that grows on human cells, and those are much better characterized because of their pathogenic potential. The viruses that replicate on the cells that we're made of, um, like adenovirus, picornavirus, SARS-CoV-2, smallpox virus, all those guys are much easier to recognize in sequence information because they've been studied so closely and there are way fewer of them. And so those we can track pretty pretty carefully, pretty um, uh, reliably in these kinds of virome sequencing studies that we like to do. And so that that's allowed us to, you know, tell some stories, to learn some things about what's going on with the uh, these large population of viruses inside humans. It's, it's really a cool area. There's so much novelty mm-hmm. in your experiment. It's just really fun. One of well, my- just before we get into your, your observations, um, I just have one quick question. For a given bacteria that lives in us, I don't know, bifido, some kind of you know strain, is there one type of phage or are there many types of phages that can affect one particular bacterial strain inside of us? Is that known? Uh, there's many, so it that it's not making it any simpler. And there are many, and there's several different kinds of phages that can grow in different ways. So if you imagine one bacteria in your body, E. coli, for example, you can have b- bacterial viruses that will uh, bump up against the cell, infect it, make lots of new copies of itself, explode the cell, and release a bunch of new copies. That's called lytic growth. That's sort of what you conventionally think of as. Um, is how a virus is going to grow. But there are other possibilities. The virus can infect a cell, inject its genetic material, and that genetic material can become integrated into the bacterial genome and just grow along like any other bacterial DNA. It, um, the, what, during DNA replication, the genome of the phage is copied just as the genome of the cell is. That's called temperate growth or a, a lysogenic phage. And so these phages can induce once in a while as well. They can, if there's DNA damage that um, happens to the bacteria, if it's in some environment that's really bad, the phage may decide that it's had enough and it wants to get out. And so it can then excise its genome, make lots of copies, explode the cell and go on to grow. So with sequence information, when we sequence a bacterial genome, today it's um, straightforward to determine the DNA sequence of a bacteria you can sometimes recognize integrated viruses in those genomes, prophages. And so most of the, bac- or a large fraction of the bacteria in your gut, the very large numbers, maybe 10 to the 11th per gram of poop, just incredible amounts. Many of those, maybe the majority, will have recognizable integrated prophages that are these sort of hitchhiker viruses. So there's very, very energetic and complex interactions between the bacteria and the bacteria phages in your gut and we infer in in most environments wait so okay a couple of things come to mind here if i have a certain kind of e coli in me in, as part of my microbiome because of phage activity and because of it just i mean maybe being in different niches within my body i probably don't have all one kind of e coli i probably have i mean you know multiple modifications of it some with an altered genome from a phage some not um, that's very possible. Yeah. Um, and then we see, if you take a, we can find good. multiple strains of E. coli in single individuals. That's, that's definitely a, a direct observation. And then if I think if I take an antibiotic, it's short sighted to say, Oh, it just wipes out your microbes. That, that may not be true at all. Maybe what it does is, um, causes, I, believe, I forget what you call the activity when a virus starts to lice the bacteria mm-hmm. and, you know, and replicate, but it may, it may kill a certain bacteria by causing the viruses in it all of a sudden to uh, to lice it and not be commensal. It could, yeah. I mean, it could do many, many things. I would guess it would affect the virome tremendously, right? 
Yeah, I like that idea. We've so far not been able to get any evidence for that, but I still, I still, I'm trying to study that idea and see if we can strengthen it. I, I like the idea that certain kinds of antibiotics may work at least in part by phage induction because some antibiotics are known DNA damagers. So it would be surprising if they didn't, at least in some settings. Now, having said that, there are arguments the other way. Um, some, At least for some phage, if you um, break the system for responding to DNA damage, they do uh, the antibiotics still work. So um, it, it's not always the case, but it might be in some cases. I think it's sort of an attractive idea. But what do you think happens to, you know, if I take a broad spectrum antibiotic, what's happening to the constituent virome? You know, the bacteriophages, are they now multiplying out of control or are they dying because there's no host for them? I mean, other ones are taking over. What What do you think is happening? Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of change. I think, as you say, I think if the hosts go away, the phage will go away. And after a dip in the numbers of viable bacteria, they're going to come back. And this period of rapid growth may, may alter how phages want to grow, the lysis lysogeny decision. They may make a different decision if bacteria is growing away into some open niche versus you know struggling in some saturated environment. So I think there's going to be a lot of secondary consequences um, with the behavior of bacterial populations. And what about the, um, you know, the trading of resources between, let's say, our microbiome and our host cells? Is that have you studied that? And is there any trading of resources between, let's say, bacteria and their phages, or is it just a purely, uh, you know, predator relationship? Uh, it's more complex than that. The because these integrating phage can often carry genes that modify the behavior of their bacterial hosts so that the bacteria is different by virtue of having the phage there. Uh, many toxins that are medically important are encoded on phage, actually. So whether the bacteria uh, poisons the host will be influenced quite strongly by whether the fa a certain kind of phage is integrated or not. And that, may inf and that may be promoting the welfare and growth of the bacteria. For example, cholera toxin is encoded on a phage. And that um, having that phage may cause the, tox the, the, co the cholera bacteria to be pooped out with extreme diarrhea and spread more efficiently. So there's, there's all kinds of complicated interactions besides just predator prey that could be taking place. It's really cool. There's so much novelty, so much to to new to find out in each experiment. We've had recently had a foray where we were able to find some new human viruses as we um, tried to annotate the the dark matter these uh, these sequences where we don't know what they are. How do you know if a, if a virus is going to attack a bacteria or you know one of our cells? Could you know that just by the, the sequence of the virus, or you you have to watch the interaction itself? Often you don't know for sure just by sequence information. Ideally, you'll do a follow-up experiment and show that um, you can find a host and grow the virus and stuff like that. There are ways of interrogating the sequence um, to ask, is this more like a bacteria, more like a, um, a human virus? But sometimes it can, it can be pretty borderline, and there have been cases that have gone back and forth for sure. So recently we found a new, what we've uh, has been determined to be a family of human viruses, which we named Redondo viruses in lung specimens, where we uh, were doing studying washes of human lung. And the students who were doing the work noticed a little bit of an alignment to um, when they did sequencing to a database virus. It didn't really look much like it, maybe a tiny bit matched. But then they found they could assemble genomes and they had very nice genome assemblies. And then they were able to get several of these, and that then allows you to interrogate databases, which we can do really efficiently today. So students then went through like 7,000 specimens that have been deposited by other workers of virome, uh, virome sequence collections and found they could see this, this virus coming up in, in lots of specimens and then say a lot about it. it turns out Redondo viruses, as we call them, because we think their genomes are round, Redondo is Spanish for round. Um, appear to be in human oral respiratory samples, exclusively human. And it turns out they're high in periodontitis. If you have uh, gum disease, these viruses seem to be really high and we're presently trying to assess if they're causal. And so that's just an example of kind of a campaign where we dug into the virome, found some new human viruses. And thanks to the modern methods, the, all the contemporary data that's available, we can actually say quite a bit about them. 
what do you think their implication is in human health? Are they just commensal with us or do they, are they involved in colds or, you know, other types of uh, sickness? Yeah, not really clear. We, as I mentioned, we see them in gum disease. We don't know if they're causing gum disease or if gum disease makes them better able to grow, or if maybe they help propagate gum disease. That last one might be kind of my guess, probably not directly causal, but making it worse over time would be my first guess, actually. Yeah. And then we also found um, in patients from the intensive care unit, we tested for levels of these viruses. And we actually found in some intensive care unit patients, they were quite high. The the prevalence is something like in 11% of people, we can find redondoviruses very roughly. And that was what we saw in the intensive care unit also. But the absolute levels were much higher in the intensive care unit than in healthy people. So it seems like there can be some loss of control and possibly some con- contribution to pathogenesis. And so we're trying to follow up on all of these questions. How do you think our immune system works? Do you think it works independently of our microbiome and our virome? Or do you think that you know our microbiome, our bacteria in us are contributing to our immune system and we're kind of all working from the same, the same system? Or do you think it's separate? I think there's good reason to think that our immune systems are sensing and responding to our microbiota, including our virome, and that this affects the microbiome, it affects our immune system, and that's an important component of health. They're talking back and forth, immune tone, as you might call it. And if it goes wrong in either direction, that's bad. Uh, If you have um, too little immune uh, activity, you can um, have um, opportunistic infections, bugs that or viruses that normally wouldn't hurt you can suddenly become pathogenic. And then going the other way, if your immune system's overactive, you can have autoimmune disease. So maintaining this balance is an important part of health. And we know that there are abnormalities if you don't have... um, microbes. For example, we can study germ-free mice or other germ-free vertebrates, and they don't develop normally. They're alive. They're, your microbiome isn't strictly required for life, but it does modify uh, your immune development, your gut development, and many aspects of proper growth. Yeah, it's hard to figure out. I mean, there's so much dynamic going on. It's, you know, it's weird. I'm thinking about bacteria that you know, let's say are that have been exposed to antibiotics before and now they become resistant, I would think that they would now attract maybe different phages or different phages out of the phages that prey upon them or interact with them would have different success now because let's say their outer membrane proteins have changed or their, you know, their genes have rearranged. Um, so that would change their constituent viral. Yeah, there's some there's some cool connections there with phage therapy. Paul Turner at Yale is trying to exploit just the kinds of trade-offs you were describing. So there's this hope that maybe you can adapt bacterial viruses to be um, antibacterial agents. If antibiotics or, you know, there's too much resistance, maybe you can use phages, lytic phages to kill bacteria. And it works to a degree historically in the former Soviet Union. There's been a lot of uh, interest in this. And so Paul's thing is trying to, he's found some phages that will attack um, uh, pathogenic bacteria and kill them. And what they bind to on the cell surface is in fact a, a protein that pumps out antibiotics. So bacteria can become resistant to, so, so there's a trade-off between maintaining resistance and evolving resistance to the phage. So that um, if you evolve resistance to the phage, then you um, uh, restore resistance, you restore sensitivity to the antibiotic and, and a back and forth there that works really, seems to work really nicely. I don't think they've published much yet, but the, the story is that there are some successful cases and others coming out of like um, University of California, San Diego and others. So it may be that we hear more going forward about phage therapy. Um, it'd be great if that worked. So I so, wonder if you could, uh, if you can deliberately cause the bacteria to evolve a defense against, you know, some kind of a uh, drug that you would take, which would then predispose it to be, you know, predated by a, a certain phage or, you know, push it along a path you know it'll take, and then it's easier to get rid of. You know, you trap it, essentially. You give it too many things to defend against or, again, change it in a way that now makes it, uh, you know, available for predation by something else. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, either a trade evolutionary trade off like uh, the Turner thing I mentioned, or just combination therapy where multiple hits on the same bacteria um, sort of act synergistically as in combination therapy for HIV. Let me tell you about uh, a, a story we um, just completed. It's about to come out uh, in nature on how the human a uh, virome gets formed. We studied um, where it comes from in babies. Would you like me to tell you about that one? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So um, when babies come out, we studied their very first poop, meconium, uh, baby's first bowel movement. And when we do that assay I mentioned of purifying virus-like particles, stain with a nucleic acid stain, look under a microscope, we see very little. But then if we do so, that same experiment a month later, we see something like 10 to the ninth virus-like particles per gram of gut contents and so on throughout life into adulthood. So where is all this stuff coming from? It seems like babies are coming out without, we think they come out without a microbiome, without a virome, and, but acquire it by one month. So where is all, what is all this stuff? So we did lots of different experiments. We sequenced the, we did, studied longitudinal samples, that is sequential sampling over time. We sequenced the virome to try to understand what that was. We sequenced the bacterium that was there. We purified bacterial strains. We sequenced the genomes of those. We carried out a bunch of functional studies. And um, long story short, what we think is happening is baby comes out without any uh, bacterial colonists. Very early in life, within the first few days, bacteria start to populate baby's gut. And these harbor integrated prophages, as we've been discussing, at least, uh, at least commonly. And sometimes those phages induce and produce viral particles. And we think that's the first wave of virus-like particles that we're seeing in babies, is these induced prophage from pioneer bacteria. Now, by about month four, we start to see more recognizable viruses that grow on human cells, like adenovirus, Khaleesi, Picorna, all the usual suspects that come into, uh, that can cause uh, gut harm and, and, or also be commensals in our guts. And we noticed a strong effect of breastfeeding um, by month four, where babies that were being uh, exposed to breast milk, either exclusively or mixed with formula, had less colonization by these animal cell viruses than did babies who were fed exclusively formula diets. So it really indicated there's a protective effect of breast milk uh, early in life. And that was pretty cool to see. You think the protective effect is because it attracts bacteria that, you know, have their own phages that fend, well, the bacteria fend off phages we don't want and, and uh, formula attracts different bacteria that have their own constituent phages that, you know, that edge out the ones that we do want? Well, there was a difference in the phages that we saw associated with breastfeeding. The uh, several bacterial species, bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, are uh, favored by breastfeeding over formula. And so we could see more phages of those lineages in the breastfed babies. So that all, that all made sense. Now for the animal cell viruses, things like adenoviruses, things that are going to grow on the gut cells in baby, uh, there's probably other, other kinds of forces involved. So breast milk is known to contain maternal antibodies which can bind to viruses and um, per, uh, inactivate them, prevent them from associating with a host or cause them to be uh, cleaned up and removed. But there's also other kinds of macromolecules in breast milk that can prevent virus infection of human cells. For example, lactoferrin, this iron carrying pr uh, protein can coat bacterial surfaces and prevent them from binding to cells. Human milk oligosaccharides, uh, the sugar polymers that mothers make to feed baby can also bind to virus surfaces and compete with attachment receptors, prevent viruses from attaching to cells and so starting infection. And that's pretty cool. Um, in humans, the human milk oligosaccharides made by mothers in mother's milk are quite variable human by human. And my guess is that that represents a red queen's race where humans have been changing, viruses have been changing, they're sort of racing back and forth uh, in a sort of Darwinian competition. And maybe that's why the sugars are so different uh, human by human. It's because there's this race playing out differently in, in, in different women, in different human lineages to try to oppose virus infection by this means. So really a fascinating battle, uh, ho um, host versus virus, 
playing out early in the in baby gut and modulated by breast milk. It, do you think that it could be not just certain bacteria that contribute to our health and trade resources with our cells, but uh, the you know the phages that attach to those bacteria as being critical of those bacteria being beneficial to us when let's say otherwise they might not be? Yeah, the the phages definitely modulate bacterial function. The it's been suggested that some phage genes may modulate the sugars that a bacteria can eat. And so that will influence how it gro- grows depending on the diet the host is eating. Bacteriophages can move antibiotic resistance genes around. They can move genes for virulence, genes for um, tox- toxigenesis, as I mentioned. So there's, there's really a lot of ways that bacteria can, that phages can influence uh, bacterial host interactions. Another thing is just bacterial predation influencing the structure of bacterial populations. So bacteria, uh, phage growth may well kill um, this or that bacterial lineage, or at least diminish its growth so that that reduces the uh, outgrowth of that bacteria. There's wonderful old ecology studies um, studying a tide pool where there are a bunch of bivalves, a bunch of different kinds of uh, clams and oysters and things. And there are a bunch of kinds of starfish that prey on them. And the, the observation was that if you remove the starfish, then one kind of bivalve might grow out, maybe the fastest growing or something like that. The starfish would feed preferentially on these fast growers and whack them back. And so the predators were imposing diversity on the prey community. So I think it's very possible that in uh, bacteria, bacteria bacteriophage interactions, it may be that phage are imposing diversity on bacterial communities by that kind of kill the winner dynamic or eating preferentially on whatever whatever lineage is, happens to be growing out and the most abundant at any one time. Yeah, man, it's so complex. So, I mean, this tells me, for instance, a bacteria inside of us can act one way depending on, you know, where it is in our body. It can act another way depending on what other bacteria are around it in our microbiome. It can act yet another way depending on the, the phage that, that interact with it. I don't know. It's a wonder that anything works and that, uh, our bodies are so resilient for so long. Well, the think of it this way. I mean, there's been Darwinian evolution playing out at a rate of, you know, a generation every 20 minutes since the dawn of time. I mean, so this is very, very optimized, I think. the, You know, if, if one kind of bacteria can resist a phage a little better, you know, one new variant can resist a little better, then that may grow out in the next generation and grow out further in the generation after that. So you have an expansion of that population. And then if some phage can uh, uh, change its its genetic material and by chance in some way that allows it to grow better on that bacteria, then it can reverse and that bacteria can diminish in abundance. And so you have this ongoing evolutionary optimization playing out at high speed over very long times. And so we're looking at a very, very sophisticated system or set of systems today. I mean, it's very, very evolved. Well, very good. How do you study such a thing? What's your recommendation on, you know, for people that want to learn more and have a career in this area or find out more about these interactions? What's a good entry point, you think? And what are the areas where there's not much known, where there's a lot to, to work on? Yeah, I think it's a wonderful area. There's there's so much open space, so much that's unknown. It, it, there's so much novelty in every experiment. It's just really totally cool. One of my one of my students put it well in a, a prelim exam. She was um, uh, being uh, questioned about her plans for her project by a, a group of faculty, and we sort of earnestly train our students to talk about the gap in knowledge that their research is going to be filling. And she said, "Well, in this case, the gap in knowledge is." pretty much all the knowledge. It was like, that kind of brought the house down. And it was very true. I mean, there's just so much you don't know about these vast populations of viruses. So my advice to someone who wanted to study this would be, try to formulate a question that's interesting and important and answerable. The, the, the world of all this stuff is so vast, that you can quickly get lost if you're just doing descriptive uh, studies without a careful focus. But given a careful focus, then you can get very, very interesting results. So in that study I mentioned of colonizing uh, new babies, our point of entry there was the finding that when we looked at particles, when we counted particles, 
we saw very few early in life um, or right when baby first was born, but then a lot more by month one. So that gave us a very clear cut question. So what are, what are all these bacteriophages, these viruses that we see in baby by month one and where are they coming from? So that, that was something that was answerable. So look for, be bold, but look for answerable questions. Well, very good. Rick, what's the best way for people to get in touch and learn more, maybe directly from you, you know, or, or read papers, uh, you know, see what your activities are about? Yeah, well, um, search online on my name and Virome, and you'll come up with these these papers and scanning the literature, search on Virome, and you'll, there's a, um, a small but uh, growing literature on people doing these kinds of studies. By virome, what we mean is um, sort of collectively studying all the viruses in a specimen or all the viruses in an organism at the same time. And uh, we just had our first conference a few months ago, right before things closed down with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so there's, there's like burgeoning interest, I think. People recognize how totally cool this all is. Being there's starting to be more and more uh, high quality papers that people can read about. So go to Google, go to the medical literature, search on Virome, and read some of the papers in top journals. That would be my my recommendation. Well, very good. Well, Rick, thanks for coming on the podcast and the stuff you're working on is uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, thank you very much, and it's been my pleasure to talk to you. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.